Uh, my name is uh, Bruce Barnes. I'm uh, uh, a member of the New Bedford Preservation Society, the sponsors of tonight's tour. This is what we do a tour like this uh, every year. We call it the VIP tour, where we highlight houses and the individuals that were important in New Bedford's history that lived in the houses. And at this particular house, well, let me talk about the house first, a very important house here in New Bedford. The uh, Roach Jones Duff House and Garden Museum was originally built by uh, William Roach Jr., who was one of New Bedford's most distinguished citizens in the early years of the Republic and New Bedford's history. He, built, he uh, built this house in 1834. He was already, at that time, he was about 75 years old. His first house, by the way, if you're familiar with New Bedford and the um, historic district, was the Marinus Hall, big house right across the street from the uh, Whaling Museum. Anyway, he built this house, he had this house built in 1834, and the Roaches were, were very well known for hiring top-of-the-line architects for their projects. And for this house, they hired an itinerant architect, basically a young man, immigrant from England. His name was Richard Upjohn. He designed this house, one of his earliest projects, and Upjohn became one of the most famous architects in the country during his lifetime. He moved, he did this house. It's one of his first commissions. A lot of times, some people think this was his very first residential building that he ever designed. I don't think that's the truth. I think he had a couple other buildings. He, he started out in Salem and moved around trying to find communities where there was a lot of wealthy <laughs> patrons. But anyway, he designed this house there. He moved on to Newport. He did a number of, uh, if you're familiar with the Belle, Bellevue Avenue buildings, he did um, King's, King's Coat kind of a gothic vibe, revival house, and also his house, the King House in Newport, is one of the most important Victorian houses um, in the country. But he designed this house in, in uh, 1834, the, the, the prevailing style at the time, the Greek revival, the big mansions on County Street for the most part during this period, from the early 18, the mid 1820s until around 1850 really, were designed in this, this style. It emulated Greek temple architecture. And um, that's what uh, Upjohn did here. Now, one of the interesting, this is a very nice house. It doesn't stand out like some of the, like the big uh, granite houses, the one right next door and the Grinnell Mansion across the street from that. But still, it's an interesting house. And one of the nice things, if you, if you have the chance to walk around this house, every side is kind of unique. Every side is interesting, you know. There was, a, there was actually a sunroom on the porch side at one point, but nonetheless, even now, the sides are interesting. So, you know, the, the architects are like that. They're very detail-oriented. They don't want to They try to dress up every space they can, and that's what he did here. But another interesting thing about this house is that the foundation of this house is brick. It's a brick house clad in wood. Very interesting. Um, if you're familiar with uh, the Mariner's home, that's also a brick house. And just the facade in the front is of uh, wood. The whole house is brick otherwise. Interesting construction technique, um, but that's what that's what's the case is here. Now, um, there were three families that owned this house as residences. The first was William Roach Jr. Second was a lady by the name of Amelia Jones. And the third was a man by the name of Mark Duff. And Mark Duff's father was really a very, very interesting and important man um, in his lifetime. Duff was the son of a, I think that his father was an Irish immigrant, came to this country probably in the late 1840s. His name was David Duff. And David Duff was a teamster. He had a wagon and a horse. And he carried goods from, from wherever, from the waterfront or wherever he needed to, to homes. He was a delivery man. And he had a family and one of his sons was named John. And John decided when he became of age um, that he would, uh, that just being a one horse teamster was not, a, was not a way to live. And he developed over a period of about 10 years an empire in delivering coal. He went from one horse and one wagon to a stable of 200 horses with all the accompanying wagons to go along. He was the major deliverer of coal in the, in, the, in the city. And he made a lot of money doing that. He owned most of Fish Island. If you're familiar with Fish Island, which is 
um, just off, you know, he kind of bought Fish Island, parts of Fish Island. He pretty much owned the whole thing to store all his coal. Um, and, but, but John, and he became very well, well to do. But John realized that the delivery business was not the way to go. Now you have to realize these are the 1890s, first couple decades of the 20th century. New Bedford is growing like crazy, not only residentially, but the textile mills are flooding the waterfront. There are, there are about 30 separate corporations that developed into textile mills during the period from uh, 1880 to 1910. And they continued to build new mills all the time. And each one of those mills had a power plant to run the mill. And just one mill, one mill, would use hundreds of tons of coal a day. So John Duff must have seen that and said, let's just drop this delivery to homes and maybe to, to, to things. And let's, and let's broker and wholesale all this coal. And that's what he did. He became a very, very wealthy man. Um, he was one of the leaders in the community during his lifetime. Now, Duff was Catholic. He was an Irishman. He was Catholic. And one of his great beneficiaries and, and philanthropies was St. Lawrence Church. He, um, he rebuilt the altar in St. Lawrence. He bought a lot of land around St. Lawrence to give to the, uh, to the, to the church. Uh, the property where um, Our Lady of um, Holy Family High School is now was, was on land that, that uh, uh, Duff bought for the church. He was also involved in all the other uh, enterprises that these that the wealthy New Bedford people were involved in. He was chair, he was on the boards of n numerous textile mills, all of, not all the banks, but many banks, all the other businesses in town. He was a new, he was a real player, important man in, in the city during his lifetime. He had four children, one of whom was Mark Duff. And Mark um, uh, was became a very important man in New Bedford as well. He was the president of the Merchants Bank. The Merchants Bank, which is the, the, the marble bank downtown uh, on uh, Purchase Street, right across the street from No Problemo, um, that was the Merchants Bank. And that was the major investment bank and, and uh, trust company in the city. It managed all the assets of the citizens and of the businesses, for the most part, in, in New Bedford. So it was a big deal. And Duff bought the house here. Mark Duff bought the house here um, after uh, Amelia Jones died in, in 1935, and he lived in it until around until the late 70s. And his estate sold the house to the city, which eventually um, passed on to Whale, and they developed it into a house museum over the next few years. Um, now, a uh, couple of other things about Duff that I want to mention. The inspiration from really my talk with on Duff is his uh, great grandson. Um, his name was William Kenny, and William Kenny's grandmother was one of John Duff's uh, children. His, her name was Nora, and he kept, told me a lot of the information uh, here tonight about about his great grandfather. Uh, he, he's he's a good guy. He's been a long time supporter of the Preservation Society, and I'm sure the other cultural institutions in the city as well. Good guy. He's uh, pretty elderly now. I probably shouldn't say this because he probably watched the video, but. Um, he, you know, he, he's, he gave us a lot of information about uh, where, where John lived. John, one of, John Duff lived in the Wilson Chapel, if you're familiar with Wilson Chapel. That was one of his first houses. He bought that around 1900 and remodeled it for himself. Um, when, when it became more uh, commercial, that end of County Street came more commercial. He moved from that house and he bought a house that we're actually going to visit tonight on Hawthorne Street, 81 Hawthorne Street. He remodeled that house in the mid-20s. Uh, for for his, his final resting place, well, final place where where he died. If you've been to St. Mary's Cemetery in the city, right across the street from Shaw's supermarket, if you've ever walked in there, or if you have someone you've, you've visited a, a, a tombstone there, you've seen the big mausoleum in the middle of it. That's John Duff's mausoleum in St. Mary's Cemetery. He was a big benefactor of of the of Catholic causes. He was uh, acknowledged by the Pope actually, for his contributions to uh, Catholic Catholicism in America in, in the early uh, uh, 20s, early 1910s and 20s. He was actually, as well, involved in po politics, and he was the postmaster for the city for a while, 
from 1900 to 1912. He was responsible for having the new post office on Pleasant Street built in 1911. He was appointed by the Republican presidents, Ro uh, uh, Teddy Roosevelt and Howard Taft. Taft, I think, came to visit New Bedford at one point during the, you know, at some point. And um, he was, uh, he obviously, he, and when, when Taft was voted out of office, um, John decided he probably wouldn't be reappointed as postmaster, so he left that position. So he was very interested, very involved in all sorts of things. Died in 1936. Um, he was such an important man. His, he had an obituary in the New York Times, actually. Pretty long obituary in the New York Times. So an important guy during his time. And um, uh, his legacy is not as well known as others, but in his own day, he was a big deal. And as a Catholic, now I know that a lot of people have said, you know, have claimed that the first, the first Catholic to be in the Wam Sutter Club was, was in the 50s or 60s, but John Duff is listed as a member of the Wam Sutter Club um, during his lifetime, and he died in 1936. This building behind me, which is the, uh, um, the parish house, or the parish house for Our Lady of Assumption Church, was uh, originally the home of a woman by the name of Mary Roach. It was right on South 6th Street, right on the street. There'll be a, uh, a picture of the house uh, on the video so you can see exactly what it looks like. And this, it's been on the, um, if you're familiar with the, the New Bedford uh, Historic Photo uh, photo Club, there's a number of pictures of this house uh, that you can look up. Just look up Mary, Mary Roach and it'll probably pop right up. And Mary Roach is a very interesting lady. She's a daughter of William Roach Sr. Her brother was William Roach Jr., the guy we were just, whose house we, we were just at. She was the, she was the last child of, the, of the William Roach Sr. and his wife, Elizabeth. There's 20 years between her oldest sibling and herself. She was born in 1777, and her sister, Elizabeth, was born in 1757. Now, if you've been to my tours, or if you've watched the videos, and I did a thing about the, uh, the, the schism at the um, Friends Meeting House and the, and, the, and the Quaker religion. And I mentioned, and it was a VIP like to, to tonight, and I talked about Elizabeth, but it was Elizabeth and Mary who together were the, were the people that were trying to uh, change and, and sort of modernize the uh, Quaker uh, teachings and religion during that time. It didn't work, but um, she was one of the ones that tried to do that. She was a very religious woman. She's very famous in her own time. Uh, she had, you know, she, the Roaches and the Rodmans, the two most important families, were very inter interconnected in a family way um, because they, they intermarried a lot. And so, you know, she had lots of, lots of nieces and nephews. She was an important person in town. She was referred to as Aunt Mary most of her life. Um, and she was very, and, and when, they, when they left the, the, the Quaker meeting, they became Unitarians. But she was always really, all those people that left the, the Quaker meeting during that time because of the, the differences between the old, what they called the old lights and the new lights, um, the ones that left the meeting really never stopped being Quakers. You know, they always thought in the same way and, and considered their relationship with God in the same way. That was, and that was Mary's thing. She was very, very religious, and, she, but, and her thing was the inner light, how, you, how you're individually related to God. And so she didn't, you know, so when she went to the Unitarian Church, which is a lot more ritualistic than, than the Friends of Meetings, um, she, you know, just dismissed all the, all the paraphernalia, <laughs> as it were. She didn't go for communion. She didn't go for any of these other things, sacraments and so forth. The only thing that mattered was the inner light. And so, um, she, but she went to Uni Unitarian Church regularly. And in the 1830s, one of the, uh, substitute uh, preachers uh, who was hired to come for a short time when the, when the regular minister was away was uh, William Ralph Emerson. Ralph Waldo, excuse me, Ralph Waldo Emerson, very, very famous philosopher and thinker. At the time, he was a pretty young man, and he was taken by um, Mary's uh, feelings about church and inner, inner, inner strength and so forth. And he, um, they became close friends. He cited her often in his writings early on. They continued to be um, um, uh, correspondence uh, until she died in, in 1848. 
Mary was in, well, she, Mary was never married. She had taken care of her elderly parents until she was 51. Um, the, 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 the elderly parents lived in what was called the mansion house. The mansion house was on the corner of 2nd and Union Street. There's, a, there's the credit unions there now. That was where the mansion house was. Mary was willed the mansion house, but it was such a big building. Um, she didn't live there. Um, she decided that, that she would build this house at some point instead. Mary never married, but she had a, she had a partner. Her name was Mary Gifford. And she and Mary lived together in this house for the rest of their lives. And when Mary, when, when Mary Roach died, she willed not only uh, the house, but all her money to, to Mary Gifford, which was kind of a, a remarkable, considering that she had so many nieces and nephews, although all the Roaches and Rodwoods are wealthy anyway. So, but anyway, she did that. And then one of the interesting things too, Mary was a fairly young woman when she first started to be Mary Roach's companion. And so she lived quite a bit of, quite a life afterwards as well. And she took up with another woman and lived in the house. But when, when Mary Gifford died, she willed all the money back to the Roach family. I thought that was kind of cool. Well, all the money that she still had, you know, she willed back to the Roaches. Kind of a cool thing, and not that they really needed it, but she, I think she just felt an obligation. She she had been given this, you know, this great wealth because of her friendship and, and companionship with Mary Roach, and she gave the money back. Anyway, kind of an interesting thing. Um, this particular house, really, when you look at the pictures of what it looked like when it was built, it doesn't look that much different. I mean, because the vital siding is a lot different, but the form of the house. This is what the house looked like. It's kind of different, kind of interesting. There's more detailing probably than you'll see, but basically this is the form that, that you'll see on in the picture. It was right on, it was right on uh, South Sixth Street when Our Lady of Assumption was um, purchased the property, and they wanted to put the the church right on Sixth, South Sixth Street. They just moved the house back. There's pictures of that actually as well on, on the uh, on the. Uh, Historic Photos website, the New Bedford Historic Photos website, have a picture of what it looked like, all the beams underneath as they moved the house back. Kind of interesting. Um, anyway, that's a brief story about Mary Roach. Very interesting person uh, in her day. She was very philanthropic as well with, uh, at the time uh, in New Bedford, um, working on charities for the poor and so forth, and, and also for the church. The house they're gonna talk about is the one right across the street, the tan one. This was built in 1860. Um, original owner, and on the plaque, his name was uh, Barton Ricketson, but he didn't live in the house very long because the family that uh, I'm going to talk about here uh, purchased the house in 1860 and lived in it for a long time, probably until the, I don't know, 1930s or 40s even. And that's the Prescott family. And the man I'm going to talk about tonight is Oliver Prescott. The Prescott family is one of the most important families in the city during the era of the development of the textile industry and even into the 1980s, actually. There were three Oliver Prescotts. The first Oliver Prescott was the one who moved in this house. He, he was a lawyer and a judge. He, made a, he was very well well to do by the time he passed away, but he, he married when he was 55 to a woman who was 25. So, and that was about 1860 or so. He had three children. He had another Oliver and two daughters, uh, Mary, who went by Molly, and um, uh, Helen, uh, who married uh, a man named Stetson. And uh, Oliver is the man of, uh, subject of the talk tonight. He was born in 1868, died in 1938. Um, he went through the usual, he was born in, into a wealthy family. His father had made good money. He was born in this house. And um, he went through the usual uh, schedule of life events to get to where he, to, be, to get to be a lawyer. He went to Friends Academy, boarding school, Harvard for his bachelor's and, and MA. And then he started working for the, uh, the most important uh, law firm in, in the city. And um, he was, he made a lot of money. He was involved, he was involved in so many activities. It's hard to believe he had time for half of them. 
not only commercial activities, he was on the boards of numerous banks, numerous textile mills. He was on, he was a president of Wamsutter Mill for a while. He was on he was on all kinds of of uh, charitable charitable boards, all kinds of things. It's hard to believe he had much time to do much of anything. He's in, much of the information I received I got about Oliver this Oliver was um, from a, a memoir that his daughter had written in 1980. It was called Mariano. And Mariano came from the estate that he bought on Tucker Road in Dartmouth. If you're familiar with the, the um, there's like a convent now, the house is set back quite a ways um, from the street, but you can still see the house. It was built in eight, that was his house for his, his recent bride. He bought this two or 300 acre farm the family was named Mariano, two ends at the end there, Mariano, and um, they were Italian immigrants, and they they sold the the farm to Oliver and his family. Most of the wealthy New Bedford people at the time, um, the mill owners and the people who were owned the mill owned the banks and stuff. The big hobby for those people was to own a yacht. That was the big thing. You owned a yacht. Um, the biggest yacht actually at the, at the New Bedford Yacht Club at Hayden Aram was called the Palestine. It was enormous. It was one of the major uh, uh, mill owners at the time. But lots of guys had yachts. That was, a, that was instead of, you know, instead of whatever rich people do today, buy fancy cars, I guess, or something, they owned yachts. But Oliver didn't want to do that. He didn't want a yacht. He wanted a farm. Buying Mariano with a couple hundred acres of land, one of his goals was to continue to have the farm be profitable. He didn't work the farm himself. He hired people to do the farm. He built a big house in front of the farm, but he kept all the farm buildings and he had a, ma a farm manager. And it was an interesting thing. It was primarily a dairy farm, but they had all sorts of, of equipment. He had the, the, way, the makings of a, a normal farm in the, in the 19th century and early 20th century. And he managed that farm very, very carefully. Um, he had a farm manager, as I said, he didn't do any of the field work or anything like that, but he made sure that the farm was profitable and that was his hobby, was the farm. So it was interesting, it was an interesting thing for him to get involved in, I, I thought. You can still see the house, actually, from, um, from the street. I didn't drive down there, there's a long driveway, it's, it's an it's a, a order of nuns, retired nuns that I think own that property now. I didn't want to drive down there in case, you know, but it's still a nice house, it looks like a mansion, and it is a mansion. Now, Oliver was, and, his, and his, his father and his son, they worked at this law firm, um, and the law firm was the biggest and most important law firm in the city. And they made, you know, they managed the funds of the, of the, the textile mills, they managed the funds of people, their estates, their, their housing transactions, everything. And they had done so for many, many years. Well, I had a friend who actually worked for the firm, the, the subsequent firm in the, um, in, the, in the 1960s. And she said they had so many closings, they had filed for so many closings in New Bedford. It was like going to the, you didn't even have to go to the registry to do a title search because the, the law firm was Crapo, Clifford and Prescott had, had done so much of the transactions of the development of the city during that time. It was like going to the, the Registry of Deeds. You didn't have to go to the Registry of Deeds. They all do is go to their files because they had done so many closings in New Bedford for so many years. Now I could go on and on about him. Oh, one of the, this is a nice story about him. One of his clients was Hetty Green. She was one of his clients. And he tells a story the first time he met Hetty Green, she would come in the, in the, Hetty always owned a lot of property in New Bedford, especially, he owned, she owned all the land, like uh, be, on Rockdale Avenue and beyond where the cemetery is now, most of uh, Buttonwood Park, all kinds of land in the West End. She still owned that land during her lifetime, during, at the end of her life. Um, that's the, all that land was developed after she died in 1916. So she would come by the off-law office every once in a while with her satchel and the way she looks in pictures with her, her, her big uh, black outfit and so forth and check, and check on her investments. So 
Oliver reported that if you walked out of the office, she would take everything that was on the, on the desk and put it in her satchel. She would just clean up, she would just steal everything on the, on the desk, put it in her satchel. So we learned when Hetty was coming to the law office, not to leave anything, not to leave anything on the desk because that would be, it would be gone because you weren't going to, you weren't going to challenge her. That's for sure. Not a client like that who was a multi, multi hundred millionaire client. Um, the other thing that, that has to be mentioned about Oliver and his two sisters is they're the ones who donated and commissioned the glass mosaic uh, uh, picture tile wall in the Unitarian Church. The most important piece of decorative art in New Bedford by far. Nothing even matches it. There's only one other item like that in the country is someplace in Philadelphia. 300 square feet, 500 pieces of stained glass by the Tiffany Company to make the mural behind the altar at the Unitarian Church. If you haven't seen it, it's beyond belief, really, to realize the beauty and the, and the, the work that went into it. It took months and months to put every piece together um, to, pick, to do the scene of a pilgrim walking in the wilderness I don't know, they, they, there's a story behind it. I guess there was a poem or a story about that particular scene that was replicated by the mural. But if you ever have, there, the Unitarian Church is open. If you haven't been in there, the Unitarian Church is open a lot on AHA night, and it's worth seeing. It's so spectacular. And they commissioned that, that um, Oliver, and because uh, he was the, uh, the head of the lay community at the church for most of his life, they commissioned that around 1911. And um, it was really one of the great gifts. It must have cost a fortune, really, to buy the to, and have the work done. But uh, really, a tremendous, a tremendous asset to the city at uh, at the Unitarian Church. This house um, behind me um, isn't part of the tour, but for those that um, haven't been on a tour before, you got to, you know, I got to. Everybody's got to be able to have a little bit of intro to this house. This is one of the great. I think probably the greatest residential property uh, in New Bedford. And uh, if you haven't been on a tour before, which I'm sure many of you haven't been, you got to see this place. This is the house built in the uh, 1840s in the Gothic Revival style. And um, again, it was a Roach family house. You could see all the fancy gingerbread inside the big gables and stuff, typical of that style. This really was a very important architect. His name was Alexander Jackson Davis that designed this house. And this ended up really being his, this design made, been, was one of his was his calling card house because it was so famous. It's a landmark property, which means that um, this is the highest designation that a uh, historic property can get in the United States as landmark status. There's only a few of those in New Bedford. This house is a house designed by an architect, a New Bedford architect, by the name of Edgar B. Hammond. Um, He's a very, very important guy in the history of the architecture of, the, of New Bedford during the period from really 1875 to 1930. Um, he, his father was an, was an architect. He, wasn't, he was an architect. He, he, he designed houses, but basically he was a builder. Um, his houses are not as interesting as Edgar. Edgar had a very, very keen eye for design. He went to um, MIT for a year to learn more about uh, design and structures and so forth. So he was well-trained and he's done a lot of interesting buildings in the city uh, other than this house. This house really is one of his, I think one of his gems as far as residential architecture is concerned, 1916. Um, it's kind of, it's kind of a, a, almost a direct copy to some degree of, the, of colonial houses built in places like Newport and Salem and so forth. He put a few twists on it here and there, but it's just a beautiful design, very balanced. It's, it's just, it's always been in tip top shape. This house still is. Lots of detailing. You can see the little brackets under the eaves, nice entryway. I mean, it's just a, a beautiful house. If you look at history books of colonial architecture, you'll see houses like this often with the dormers, three or four, even more dormers across the top. Um, and he, he kind of replicated that design, but nonetheless, it's a beautiful house. Now his, um, his catalog, 
of uh, buildings in New Bedford is extremely long and distinguished. Perhaps his most, um, well, I, I wouldn't even say his most anything because anybody could, could pick out some of his great buildings. But um, the Duff House, the Duff Building rather, in downtown New Bedford, the big house I talked about earlier on uh, Pleasant Street was designed by Edgar Hammond. Um, he also designed the building that now houses um, Freestones. He has um, uh, houses throughout the city. If you were on, if we've been on my tours, I mentioned him all the time. There's another house we might walk by when we go back to the to uh, uh, RJD that on the corner. I'll point that out. Lots of residential properties, um, and and in his day, he did a lot of uh, public buildings as well, police stations, um, firehouses. He was very very active, and one of his most interesting and well-known now uh, commissions is he designed the Bourne Building at the Whaling Museum and the Lagoda. He was responsible for overseeing the building of the whale, the model of the whale ship Lagoda in the Whaling Museum. Kind of an, that was a pretty interesting commission. I don't think he was a sailor by any means. Well, he was a sailor, actually. I shouldn't say that. He was a sailor. Um, so maybe that's one of the reasons why he was tapped for the, for the job. But anyway, that's, it's the, that project was, is well, very well known for that. But he did projects throughout the city, um, you know, almost too many to, to, to enumerate. Now, he was also very involved with yachting. Now, he didn't have, as an architect, he, was, he made some money, but he didn't make the money that uh, the other people that we've talked about, John Duff, he was nowhere near that category. Oliver Prescott, you know, Edgar had a good, he lived in his father's house actually on North Street all his life. So he didn't have to, he didn't have to pay rent or mortgage, I guess. Um, so he saved money that way, but he always had a yacht. He was very, very interested in, um, in, in, the, in the Bedford Yacht Club. The first yacht club, there'll be a picture of it on the, on the video, was on um, Pope's Island. If you're familiar with where Captain Leroy's is now, it's a charter place. That's where the yacht club was. Beautiful stick style building. It was on pilings, you know, in, in the in the uh, in the harbor. And that was the original New Bedford Yacht Club, built around 1878 or 9. Um, Hammond was pretty young at the time, but I don't think his father could have pulled off that design. I think for sure he designed that original yacht club. Very cool building um, in, a, in a unique style. Um, and he also designed the Yacht Club that currently stands, the New Bedford Yacht Club that currently stands in the Paid Narrow. So um, he was, uh, 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 and he was a yachtsman himself. I don't know how they do things, but he was the Commodore of, of the club. I'm not, that must be some kind of either the honorary or maybe real de design leadership designation for the Yacht Club. So he was very, inter very interested in the Yacht Club, and um, that, was his, that was one of his things. Oddly, around late 20s, the um, Yacht Club wanted to remodel the interior of the building in Payton Arrow. But they didn't hire Hammond. I don't know why that is the case. They hired a guy named Nat Smith. And I did a project about Nat Smith uh, a few years ago, and he was a subject of one of our walking tours a couple of years ago. And for some reason, they hired Smith to do the job. Cameron must have been just done with architecture, didn't want to do it anymore, maybe couldn't do it anymore. I don't know. He didn't die. He died in 1937, so he could have done the, his, the job. But anyway, gave it to, to Smith. Um, but anyway, he was a very active uh, man. Um, his, his rap sheet is not as, as long as far as uh, other things other than being in the yacht club and, and, and also uh, being an architect because they weren't making that kind of money. Edgar B. Hammond. He was born in 1854, I believe, and died in 1937. The VIP for this house is a lady by the name of Rachel Howland. She was born in uh, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Quaker woman, born in, I think, um, 1916, and died in 1902. She was married to Matthew Howland. Her name was Rachel Smith, actually. But she married uh, Matthew Holland, who was a uh, whaling merchant, very successful whaling merchant. And um, they built this house for themselves here. Now, originally, this house was 
more like the house we just saw with all the gingerbread in the column in the columns. It was a Gothic revival. And it is the basic form of the house hasn't changed much, but all the detailing has been stripped off. There are pictures of this house with um, a full porch and the and the four column type of Gothic post, all the gingerbread in the columns and so forth. That's where the house originally was built in the Gothic revival style. There are pictures of that. That I, that I think I still have that we can put in the video so you can see what it looked like when the Howlands lived in it. Now, they also, the, the Howlands were well to do whaling merchants during the, the golden age of whaling. They were making lots of money. They owned all the land across the street to Grove Street. They also owned property uh, in the south end, half of Hazelwood Park, all the way uh, and north to the, where the roads are now. There's an intersection there, but they owned all that land as well. You know that little building that nobody ever knows what it is? It's behind the, the it's not the big stone one, but the one next to it. That was Rachel's summer house. It was a, it was a barn originally, but then it was um, converted to a resident. She converted it to a residential property for, as a summer house. And the clubhouse or the white building that's there now, which was a club, it's a, I think a community center, that was her son's house at one time. He built a house on the site too. So they owned a lot of land. And uh, Rachel was a kind of a, a living legend in her own time. Um, she was a very forceful woman in the Quaker community. She, early on, she was recognized as an outstanding speaker. One of the great virtues of, 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 of the Society of Friends Quakers was their feeling about equality. Women did not have a had no rights really in, during this time, but the Quakers encouraged uh, women to speak at meetings. And if they were good speakers, they were, they were uh, given permission to speak at other uh, congregations, other meetings, and even other, other churches if they were invited. And Rachel was one of them. She was very, very influential lady. Um, she spoke all over the Northeast really. And she was invited to speak in New York, every, every place during her lifetime. She was very well respected. She also, in New Bedford, is responsible for all sorts of charities. The Relief of Aged Women, there was a city mission. There were, lots of them had to do with women's issues, but not exclusively. She and her husband built a chapel for the, uh, for the workers, a non-denational chapel for the workers at the, at the Wamsutter Mill on uh, at the, that end of, uh, of uh, Purchase Street. She did all sorts of things. Um, and, and she was well respected and she was no wallflower either, you know, I mean, because at one point there was an audit, kind of a dust up in New York about uh, Presbyterians um, not wanting to let a, a, a Quaker preacheress uh, speak. Oh boy, and Howland was all over that like a wet blanket. She, you know, she was ripping the, uh, the minister of that church in the papers uh, very sarcastically, really. It was pretty pretty brutal, really. So she was, a, she was a, um, a very, very forceful woman. In, 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 in the show, her, the respect that she had in the community, in uh, the 1860s, the late 1860s, after the Civil War, there was a big strike at the Wamsutter Mill over the 10-hour day. Fall River, the workers in Fall River had negotiated a 10-hour day from 11 to 10 hours. It was a big deal. It didn't seem like a big, doesn't seem like a big deal now. It was a big deal to, to lose that, to make that one hour. Um, and it looked like it was going to be enacted as law in the Commonwealth. The 10 hour day would be, would be uh, enacted as a law. You could not uh, ask workers to work more than 10 hours a day. And so it looked like, you know, everything was fine. And the, you know, the workers in Bedford thought, that, well, we'll just, we'll, we can get this the 10 hour day. But the leader of the mill just dug his heels in and didn't want to um, uh, allow this to, to happen, even though it was probably going to be passed by the legislature. Anyway, there was a strike, and it was very contentious. It was unexpected, actually. You know, they thought they would get it, and it was unexpected. And they actually, both the, the management and the workers, called, uh, asked um, Rachel to see if they could mediate the strike. Now... To ask a woman to mediate on a, a business like this was an unbelievable, really, uh, responsibility. And she, she really wasn't, 
the history books, a lot of the history books say that she was successful. She wasn't successful, actually. She got everybody to sit down, talk with one another. But the only thing that got the 10-hour day was the legislature actually passing the law, which forced New Bedford to give him the 10-hour day. But nonetheless, just being called in, having that kind of respect, um, was a big deal. Now, Rachel, at the end of her life, had some tragedy. In the 1870s, the whaling industry was doing most of their whaling in the Arctic Ocean, the Western Arctic of, off the coast of Alaska and Siberia. And they had uh, weather anomalies in two separate years that, and the fleets were lost. And um, they hurt the Howlands tremendously, their finances tremendously, so much so that they couldn't even pay for their estate. They were in arrears. An estate this size took an army of people. They had probably a dozen people who worked on the estate full time. They couldn't even pay them, really. And things were going south badly, financially. And, they, she, and when Matthew died, her husband died in 1884, the, the, the creditors took, took the property and kicked Rachel out of the house. Now, that was very unusual. Often, this, these foreclosures and these bankruptcies and stuff happened a lot, but when people, you know, the pillars of the community usually got to keep their houses, but Rachel was kicked out, and she was not thrilled about that. It was a big blow to her. It didn't stop her from continuing to work on things. She, she organized a, something called the Instructional Nurses Association, um, a, a chapter in New Bedford which was going to help women there were so many women working in the textile industry, the more infant mortality rate was so high that, um, you know, and it was mostly because the women had to work, they had to leave their babies, babies weren't getting nutrition and so forth. So the Instructional Nurses Association was formed. She formed the chapter here, even late in life. She was still active. But in, in 1897, her youngest son, who was the leader of the Howland Mills, which is an important mill site here in New Bedford at the time, Howland Place in the South End. I'm sure people are familiar with that. That was his mill. Um, he got involved in a scandal. It was, it was really his mismanagement of, there was a strike at the time. He mismanaged the funds, didn't really anticipate how long the strike would go, and the mill uh, was going to fail. And just before, and when he knew it was going to fail, he committed suicide. That was the kicker for Rachel, I think. She left New Bedford, went to live with one of her sons in Providence. And um, even though, and it was probably very shameful for her to have so much tragedy in her life, especially her son losing her life, losing the mill. It was, it, was, it was just a disaster. Lots of people lost lots of money in the failure of the mill. And uh, it was just too bad. The White House was the home of... Um, John H. Clifford, the only man from New Bedford to become governor of the Commonwealth. And um, Clifford was a very interesting guy. He was a politician, sort of a politician. He, um, he really liked being attorney general of the, of the Commonwealth. And uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't elected then, it was appointed by the legislature. So he got, and he must have been a popular guy because various parties um, would uh, continue to uh, select him as attorney general, which was very unusual at the time. But he became governor um, for one term, didn't like it, and went back to being attorney general until they decided to elect it. And he didn't like elections, apparently, because then he decided he would not run for election. But anyway, good, interesting guy, very well connected. Um, one of his best friends was the chief uh, justice of the Supreme Judicial, Co judicial Court in the Commonwealth, his name was Lemuel Shaw, S-H-A-W, and, and Judge Shaw was one of the most um, important judges in the country. Judge Shaw is responsible for a couple of major things that are still popular, that are still in, in the legal system today. Circumstantial evidence and reasonable doubt. He invented those precedents uh, during various uh, uh, trials that he um, conducted. And his daughter married Herman Melville, the author of Moby Dick. And he's the story on this particular tour, because they all inter intertwine here. Melville was um, 
a nobody when he first came to New Bedford in, in, 18, in 1840. He um, came to New Bedford in December of 1840 to ship out on a whale ship called the Akushnet. And the ship, the whale ship left in, I think, like January 1st or 2nd, 1841. And from that one voyage, you know, he took the whale, he took the voyage, he jumped ship in the, uh, in the Pacific Ocean. He hopped around, island hopped around for a while in places that had cannibals and stuff. And he had a very interesting life when he was out there. And he produced some books um, that were, you know, kind of travel logs and adventure stories about his life out there. And then he, then he, he produced his masterpiece, Moby Dick. So he was a celebrity for a little while, a minor celebrity, but nonetheless well known. And he was married to Judge Shaw's daughter. So at one point, Judge Shaw, even though he was Chief Justice of the Supreme Judicial, the highest judge in the, in the state, he still did circuit duty. So they were going to do circuit duty in Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard. And he asked Herman, hey, you want to go down to uh, do circuit duty with me? We're going, down, we're going to go down and stay with uh, Governor Clifford for a while. Then all three of us are going to go do circuit duty in Nantucket. So Herman said, yeah, you know, let's, let's do it. And he went, and because he had tremendous respect for Judge Shaw. He said he was a great man among great men, about the highest praise that you can make for somebody. So they went into circuit duty. And uh, they went to Nantucket, and, you know, Judge Shaw cleared cases and so forth. And they, at night, they'd hang out with the, with the gang at, uh, in Nantucket and, you know, and sit and smoke cigars and drink Madeira. And while at one of these sessions, John Clifford told a story that he was that a case an interesting case he was working on a, a case of a polygamist, a guy who had family who turns out to have families all over the, the 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 East Coast. One of those families was in Massachusetts, and there was a lawsuit going on about this guy and his wife. And the wife was a very interesting cat per person, as it turns out, according to Clifford. And he told the story to Herman, and Herman was pretty intrigued by it. He said, you know, you know, he thought about it. He mulled it over for a while. After the trip was over, they came back home. And he said, and he developed a story for it. You know, he thought it was a good story. Now, Melville had published Moby Dick in 1851, and it was kind of, wasn't reviewed, it wasn't that well received, actually. You know, it was not badly received, but it wasn't the big hit he thought it would be. Thought it was his great work, and it was his great work. But people didn't really get it. Thought it was, a, you know, they didn't really get it as much as he thought they would. And then he published another book volume, of, of another story, another novel called Pierre, which was a total flop. It was nobody liked it. Even even he had an English publisher who did who actually read read the manuscript said I'm not even publishing this. It was so bad in in their view. It was a it was a big flop. So he's working off that. He's you know this is the next project. He's trying to find a new project, and he decides maybe I'll write the story that John Clifford gave me. He thought it was pretty interesting about this thing called called the story Isle of the Cross. It took him a long time to write it because it was a com complex story and he wanted to make, it was an actual case, so he wanted to, he had to change the names to protect the innocent and all that. But it took him a long time to write the story. Melville fi finishes the Isle of the Cross, submits it to his publisher, and they say, no, we don't want, this is not, we're not going to publish this. He worked so hard on this. For some reason, he spent a lot of time on this. He agonized over it, published it, thought it was decent. And he submits it to his publisher, and they say, no, we can't, we don't want to publish it. And he just gave up on it. And The Isle of the Cross is known to have been written by Melville. It's in the archives of the, of the Hopper, and, Hopper and Brothers, was the publisher. And um, so they know the thing, the thing was written, but it's never been found. It just disappeared. The, the people are still looking for it. They're hoping it appears someday. Like Billy Budd, one of his other things, he wrote the, wrote the manuscript and it was tucked away in a, a trunk that was almost thrown out and not discovered until I think the 1920s or the teens or something like that. So people are still thinking that the Isle of, of the Cross will show up sooner or later about this polygamist and his, and his uh, meanderings and the, and the girls and so forth that, uh, that he uh, will, you know, betrayed. But anyway, interesting story about Melville and his, and his uh, relationship to New Bedford. While he was in New Bedford the second time, visiting here, staying at uh, this particular house, um, when he first came, he was just a, you know, ragamuffin sailor looking for a, a, the, the lowest job. And when he came back in the 1850s, kind of a celebrity, had lunch at the, at the James Arnold Mansion, got to visit the other big, uh, the other gents, as they called them at the time, in New Bedford. So it was kind of cool. Thanks for coming. Hope to see you again in another tour.